You know, in the world of political commentary, it is amazing sometimes how quickly that a commentator must change their plans. Uh, I had planned to kind of experiment with a little bit of a, of a podcast I'm going to start doing, uh, something where we talk about two or three topics in a week, and it goes a little bit longer than some of our video presentations uh, that you see every week here on YouTube. I was going to put one of those together and, and, and see about adding a podcast to the things I do. And uh, I'd written this whole thing up and was getting ready to tape it tonight. But before I did so, I saw throughout the media today, as I taped this on, on Wednesday night, the 24th, I see throughout, or Thursday night, I should say, I see throughout the media a whole lot of, uh, whole lot of talk about Cliven Bundy and some things he said today. Some supposedly racist statements that he made. Some statements that were allegedly so atrocious that even people who had defended him for the last several weeks were backing away from him now. Sean Hannity backing away from him. Politicians backing away from him. All kinds of conservatives saying, nope, 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 that's not what we believe. Well, I wanted to weigh in on this a little bit because I think in this particular controversy, Cliven Bundy's getting a raw deal. I have seen and heard Bundy's comments. And I am here to tell you that what Mr. Bundy stated today, or what we saw today in his statements, was not racist. And in fact, if you don't want to believe me, I will be providing for you, at the end of my little commentary here, I will provide for you on this video, the entire video of Cliven Bundy's comments, not just the minute or so that Media Matters selectively brought to you, or the New York Times brought to you. I'm going to give you the whole thing. You'll see the whole thing. And a hat tip to Patrick Dollard out on Twitter for pointing this out. It's the first place I saw it. If you look at Cliven Bundy's entire comments with an open mind, I am confident that you will see he said nothing racist in nature about African Americans or anybody else for that matter. Had Cliven Bundy said anything to the effect of blacks are incapable of success or blacks are incapable of doing anything other than uh, being on government assistance, had he said that, then that would have been racist and that would have been worthy of condemnation of the strongest kind. However, he said nothing of the sort. Instead, what Mr. Bundy argued was that the state of the black family today is far worse than it was in previous times in American history up to and including slavery. And that, that breakdown in the black family is largely responsible for much of the pathology, the crime, and yes, the reliance on government assistance, government subsidizing as he put it, that we see in our black communities today. Now, while those statements might have been uncomfortable for some people to listen to, and while he certainly did not use the King's English in making those statements, and while his statements might not have been as well spoken as others would have made them, his statements were nevertheless factually correct. He was right. He wasn't racist, he was right. And I'm not sure that facts can be racist. Although I suppose there's probably some people out there that would like to believe they can be. However, I go back to uh, one of the people that we talk about on this show quite often. I refer to him a lot in my commentaries, a gentleman named Walter E. Williams, who has done a great deal of work in this field over the last several decades. And what Clive and Bundy said today was not much different than what the research that Williams puts forth shows. I'm going to quote to you here from an essay written by Walter E. Williams back in 2005. It's an essay entitled Victimhood, Rhetoric or Reality. You can find it in Williams' book, Liberty Versus the Tyranny of Socialism. On the subject of the black family, Walter E. Williams, who is an African American himself, although it should not matter, but clearly to some people it will, Williams says this, and I quote, What about the decline of the black family? 
In 1960, only 28% of black females between the ages of 15 and 44 were never married. Today, it's 56%. In 1940, the illegitimacy rate among blacks was 19%. In 1960, 22%, and today it's 70%. Some argue that the state of the black family is the result of the legacy of slavery, discrimination, and poverty. That has to be nonsense. A study of 1880 family structure in Philadelphia shows that three quarters of black families were nuclear families, comprised of two parents and children. In New York City in 1925, 85% of kin-related black households had two parents. In fact, According to Herbert Gutman in The Black Family and Slavery and Freedom, 1750 to 1925, five and six children under the age of six lived with both parents. Therefore, if one argues that what we see today is a result of a legacy of slavery, discrimination, and poverty, what's the explanation for stronger black families at a time much closer to slavery? a time of much greater discrimination and of much greater poverty. I think that a good part of the answer is there were no welfare or great society programs." End quote. And we've talked many times on this show that the poverty and pathology present in the black community today is not an unbroken line going all the way back to slavery. And that programs such as the Great Society were not necessary, and welfare programs were not necessary to bring African Americans up to a level where they could compete. And indeed, that has not happened. We've talked many times on this show that between the years of 1936 and 1959, incomes of blacks relative to whites doubled and that the rise of blacks in professional and other high-level occupations was greater in the five years preceding the Civil Rights Act of 1964 than it was in the five years afterward. Poverty among black families was 87% in 1940, but that was down to 47% by 1960, all before the Great Society, all before the Civil Rights Movement, all before all of these programs and federal government interference that were supposed to bring blacks to the same level of competition of everybody else, and yet it has not happened. That's essentially what Cliven Bundy was saying. He was not pining for a return to slavery. In fact, when you watch his full video, I will provide you momentarily, you will see that he very clearly states that we should not want blacks to go back to an earlier time in history. Of course, that part of the video got edited out by Media Matters and New York Times and everybody else. You will see it here momentarily. But what he was bemoaning was the destruction of the black family, which has undoubtedly led to the poverty, the crime, the lawlessness that exists in our urban cities today. It is not racist to point these facts out. Instead, it is a way of saying that it need not be this way. That what we see in America's black communities today and in our inner cities need not be the reality. That blacks are not predestined to this type of lifestyle and that they have every capability and every potential to live the same lives anybody else who is successful does in America. And that it is the federal government that most often prevents them from doing so by way of programs and laws that discourage the black family staying together and that encourage single motherhood, fatherless children, and broken homes. That's what Clive and Bundy was saying, and I agree with him. So, if you don't believe me, make up your own mind. Here is the entire video of all of Clive and Bundy's comments. Judge for yourself. And so what I... What testifying to you. Uh, I was in the Watts riot. <coughs> I seen the beginning fire and I seen the last fire. <coughs> what I seen is civil disturbance. 
people are not happy, people are thinking they don't have their freedoms, they don't have these things, and they didn't have them. We've progressed quite a bit to, from that day until now, and we sure don't want to go back. We sure don't want these colored people to have to go back to that point. We sure don't want these Mexican people to go back to that point. And we can make a difference right now by taking care of some of these bureaucracies and do it in a peaceful way. Let me tell, talk to you about the Mexicans. But these are just things I know about the, the, the Negro. I want to tell you one more thing I know about the Negro. When I when I go went uh, go through Las Vegas, North Las Vegas, <coughs> and I would see these little government houses. And in front of that government house, the the door was usually open, and the 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 older people and the kids, and there's always at least a half a dozen people sitting on the porch. They didn't have nothing to do. They didn't have nothing for their kids to do. They didn't have nothing for their young girls to do. And because they were basically on government subsidy, and so now what do they do? They abort their their young children. They put their young men in jail because they never they never learned how to pick cotton. And I've often wondered, oh, are they better off as slaves picking cotton, having family life and doing things, or are they better off under government subsidy? They just transfer. They, they, they just transfer the yeah, they didn't get no more freedom. They got less freedom. They had less uh, family uh, alive, and their happiness. You can see in their faces they weren't happy sitting on that con con concrete sidewalk. Down there, they were probably growing their turnips. So that's all government. That's not freedom. Now let me talk about the Spanish people. You know, I understand that they come over here against our Constitution and cross our borders. <coughs> but they're here, and they're people. And I've worked beside beside a, a lot of them. Don't tell me they don't work, and don't tell me they don't pay taxes. Mm -hmm. And don't tell me they don't have better family structures than most of us white people. When you see those Mexican families, they're together, they're picnic together, they're spending their time together, and I'll tell you, in my way of thinking, they're awful nice people. And we need to have those people join us and be with us. Not, not, not come to our party.